everybody, and welcome to another episode of What a Hell of a Way to Die. It is just Nate this week. However, joining me today uh, is the the journalist author, Vincent Bevins, author of the just recently released book, The Jakarta Method, Washington's Anti-Communist Crusade and the Mass Murder Program that Shaped Our World. Uh, as I understand it, Vincent, it may have just sold out its first print run, and uh, congratulations on that. Welcome to the show. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It, uh, they, or- they ordered a reprint, which is really good news. It doesn't mean that they've sold... Uh, a lot, but it's, it means they sold slightly more than they expected, which is a small victory for sure. Well, that's incredible. So you're joining us from Sao Paulo, Brazil, and Brazil factors significantly into this book. Um, I wanted to, ra- rather than trying to summarize it all from the title and subhead, I thought maybe if you could give the listeners just your brief summary as to the scope of the book and perhaps touch on some of your motivations for wanting to cover this topic. Yeah, sure. So the the book is about anti-communist mass murder in the Cold War and the apex of this, these intentional programs to exterminate leftists or accuse leftists was the 1965 massacre in Indonesia, which took the lives of approximately one million innocent people. Now, this was one of the most important turning points of the Cold War. Uh, I say that is probably the, the most important victory for the goals that Washington was um, was pushing in the 20th century. And this was um, such an obvious victory to other people around the world, other right-wing regimes or potential anti-communist allies, that they copied and learned from this massacre. And this is what is the quote-unquote Jakarta method, because in Brazil and Chile, they had sort of things called Operation Jakarta or Plan Jakarta or a graffiti program, uh, a graffiti campaign on the streets of Santiago de Chile saying Jakarta is coming, which meant we're going to kill you. And, and those allies around the world that, that looked to Indonesia and believed that they could do something similar and it, that it would work and that it would, they would get away with it, were very tragically right on all three counts. And um, through the course of the book, which I tell through first person interviews with people uh, I met uh, in 12 different countries. What becomes clear is that, number one, uh, in over 20 countries that were allied with the United States during the Cold War, right-wing regimes carried out intentional mass murder programs to kill leftists and opponents to the growing capitalist order. And number two, that this was a fundamental part of the way that Washington won the Cold War, so fundamental that it really sh- shaped life to this day, especially in the former third world. And, and, and as you said, where I'm sitting in, in Sao Paulo now is a pretty good example of that. I mean, we have, we have a president here now who affects my life every day, for better or worse, that comes directly from this legacy of fanatical anti-communism. He, as he rose to power, uh, he very famously said that Brazil could only improve if, they, if the government did what the dictatorship failed to do and, and kill at least 30,000 people basically wipe the left off the face of the earth. And this is just probably the most extreme example of the ways that the dirtiest and, and under understood aspects of the Cold War changed the shape of the globalization that we ended up getting in the 21st century. So there's a line early on in the book that struck me because I, I think you mentioned this significantly, that although Indonesia was such a massive cornerstone of this campaign of mass murder. It was one of the, if not the most successful in terms of the forces of anti-communism and reaction. And it inspired so many similar actions by right-wing governments across the world. But in the English-speaking world, at least, it's almost forgotten. It, it, it's in, in fact, I think it would be fair to say that it's, almost, it's entirely forgotten. It may have never been acknowledged in the first place. I know that Joshua Oppenheimer's films have brought some attention to it but in the English-speaking world. But the line I, I, I was going to quote from your book uh, specifically talks about, um, I, b- I believe you're talking about Ro- Robert Kennedy, but uh, specifically he said, within a few years, Indochina would dominate international headlines, until, but in, until the middle of the 1960s, most officials considered Indonesia far more important than Vietnam or Laos. And you went on later to, you know, through reporting, describe the fact that uh, Robert McNamara, you know, in his memoirs acknowledged that basically because Indonesia was succeeded, because there was no big, big domino in the domino theory anymore, the, the U.S. military presence and subsequent war in Vietnam wasn't really necessary, and they knew that at the time. 
Right. Exactly. And yet, and yet, in, and yet Indonesia is it, it, it basically it, this this book is it's not necessarily talking about anything that's new or unknown, but it might as well be to the English speaking world. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, absolutely. So Indonesia, I think that Indonesia fell off the the map of sort of historical memory in the English speaking world, not only in terms of what happened in 1965, but just like as a country. I mean, when I moved there, everyone was like, oh, like Micronesia, whatever, Polynesia. I'm like, no, this is the fourth most populous country in the world. It's the largest Muslim majority country in the world. This is a hugely important nation. And it kind of got pushed way deep down into the memory hole after 1965. And as you say, everybody in the U.S. foreign policy establishment in the early 60s knew that Indonesia was by far the biggest um, the most important country at play in the Cold War. There's a couple reasons for that. Uh, just the size of it uh, is 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 a main um, reason. And also because President Sukarno was the founding leader of the Third World Movement, which was, even though the, 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 the term Third World is used in a derogatory fashion these days, at the time was a very optimistic and uh, uh, audacious uh attempts to bring together all the post-colonial countries and to sort of reshape the global order. And um, when he was eventually overturned, uh, overthrown in 1965, 66, and when it was done in this really horrible way, I think that Indonesia totally dropped off the map for two reasons. One is that Vietnam became domestic politics in the United States, right? So... Uh, all politics are local, and in the United States, people knew somebody was going off to Vietnam, and this was a big quagmire. This was a big problem for the United States. Uh, you know, as I've been a journalist for a little over a decade now, and I know that problems make news, and uh, countries that pass seemingly naturally into the U.S.-led world order do not make news. Of course, it was not natural at all, but it was it was often presented that way. And number two, I think, and this is, I think. Um, the darker side of, of, of the reason, I think that what happened there and the violence that the U.S. encouraged and supported and participated in was just so awful that it was impossible to integrate into our idea of what the 20th century was all about. You know, something that, that struck me also in describing the way in which the memory of this was suppressed and erased, and similarly in Brazil, uh, with regard to the military dictatorship, which you discuss in the book, uh, in addition to Indonesia, and in, in fact, you cover numerous situations around the world, is that in Indonesia, in Brazil, not only is memory, the memory of this not formally acknowledged, but it's, it's, it's still violently repressed. And in fact, there is sort of an official cult of observance of declaring it the enemy. Uh, you talk about the the monuments in Brazil and in Indonesia to basically the m- martyrs of anti-communism, the 30th September movement in Indonesia, uh, which has never from from the book is it, it states has never really been conclusively explained, but is sold was sold by the Indonesian government as this uh, mass basically this, this barbaric murderous uprising with the intention of communists basically committing acts of witchcraft and perversion and, and just indiscriminate violence against basically against all the forces of decency. Um, I, you, you talk about how this happened in Brazil. I, I felt I marked down this passage that basically because of what the, the I don't, I don't speak Portuguese, but the, the Intentona Comunista basically yeah, communist uprising. Right. Uh, you, you describe the imagery that they they employed to create this idea of communists, not just as a dangerous political tendency, but literally psychotic violence. So you describe it as communists with knives drawn, ready to stab you in your sleep, became a common trope in Brazil's voluminous anti-communist material over the next few decades. In the press, you could also find illustrations indicating that communists were insects that could only be, quote, exterminated with liberty, the family, and morality. Communism was called a plague, a virus, or cancer, terms that were also hurled at communists at the time in nearby Argentina. More often than not, communism was associated with pure evil or witchcraft, drawn with the use of demons or satanic beasts, such as dragons, snakes, and goats. There was often the implication or outright depiction of sexual perversion and deviancy. Uh, reading that, and then thinking about some of the rhetoric thrown around today, in, in literally in this present moment, with basically popular uprising in the United States being depicted in similarly fantastic and deranged terms, it seems to me that th- this, is, this is an ongoing tendency. And I wonder 
Do you feel like there is a similar tendency in the United States, not the same, obviously, but similar with regard to our unwillingness to confront what we've done or what we've, we've helped to do in countries around the world since 1945? Uh, yeah, the short answer is yes. Um, and as you said, there are, there are monuments both there are monuments in Brazil and Indonesia to the to the victims of communism, not to the victims of anti-communism. That would be, that would be, they they would never allow that. I mean, to the to this day, Indonesia still it's illegal to to defend communism in any way. And, and Jair Bolsonaro, Eduardo Bolsonaro, or Eduardo Bolsonaro, who's the president's son, wants to reproduce that law in Brazil to explicitly outlaw the defense of communism. But um, yeah, totally. I think that what I saw. I mean. The way, I mean, yeah, it's the same thing. I mean, so one of the one of the the reasons I bring up that imagery in in Brazil in 1964 is that what we failed to understand in the 20th century is that it was not only the left that had an international scope. The anti-communist international was very actively um, collaborating across borders, and they would trade, let's call them technologies of terror. They would they would learn what kinds of things you could say to justify your oppression. They would learn what kinds of repression worked the best. And I think it's not a coincidence that that passage you just read is uh, extremely resonant with the, the, the story that Suharto told in 1965 to justify his extermination of the um, Indonesian Communist Party. I think it's really likely that they were all learning from each other. I mean, they were literally meeting up every, you know, they had there was the, the World Anti-Communist League and they would meet up and they would trade strategies. And the thing about that strategy, the one you just described, of pointing to some kind of a um, devious minority from the outside that actually uh, is not really one of us and then using that to, justif- uh, to justify crushing the entire movement, is it, it works. It's extremely effective. And... Absolutely the way that I've seen people in the U.S. political class talk about the protests in the last week <laughs> reminded me in very uncomfortable ways of the effectiveness of that strategy, right? I mean, there was like the NYPD, I don't know what his like, technical title is, but he's insisting that, well, the pro- protests are good, but these protests are people from California, right? Like they're from outside. They're not really actually the protesters, but of course, it's nonsensical because there's protests in California. Like, are they switching? Is everybody switching like protests across the country? But if the thing about these these right wing terror tactics, and I think this is why it's so important, as you say, to confront their employment in the 20th century, not only because they shaped our world, but because they continue to be used over and over. And um, very unfortunately, they work. Like, if you call. You know, Brazil just copied, you know, two days after Trump did it, Brazil just, or Bolsonaro just said that uh, anti-fascist groups here, uh, there was a march on Sunday that they're terrorists and they're not really part of the body politic and therefore must be expunged somehow. And so absolutely, not only, not only did this, is this something we need to confront because it happened and it was, it was so important, but because these technologies never went away. Something that's interesting to me when I think about what you just said, the confrontation of this or our need to confront this, is that maybe not many of them, but some of our listeners, either themselves or through people they know, may have encountered people in the U.S. military, for example, who were involved in some of these various what we would call sort of support operations around the world uh, in places like El Salvador, in places like Honduras, Guatemala, even to this day. I mean, I I left the military in 2014. I was in from 07 to 14. I spent time in Honduras and El Salvador. There's a very, very active and aggressive U.S. military, primarily special operations presence in places like Guatemala, Panama, uh, to some extent, the Dominican Republic and Jamaica. Uh, they, they're all over. Um, and and some of that is soft power, and some of the most of that is is uh, basically being able to marshal the forces of those countries to basically do whatever what they want. And, and in some ca- some capacity, it's uh, anti drug trafficking. But in a lot of cases, from my experience, it's it, it, we'll put it this way. You don't see a whole lot of social justice movements being successful in places like El Salvador and Honduras, and I don't think that's a coincidence. Right. And and so, in a way, looking at this, it feels as though the, the even the U.S. military has been able to 
separate this from its actual consequences to the point where, you know, uh, somebody like myself, if I didn't know anything, I mean, I got sent to Honduras and I had zero idea about what, Hon you know, Honduras's history, its role in the Cold War, uh, its role in, you know, the Central American independence struggles, uh, the fact, you know, the, the things that happened in neighboring countries, you know, with Americans like William Walker in the 1850s, all of this stuff, none of it, none of it's told to you. And so, uh, that's not really like meant to be a sort of innocence abroad th thesis as much as to say it strikes me that not the CIA, not just the CIA, not just special operations, but even regular sort of rank and file regular military people have been sent to assist this stuff. And that has been the story of the American military experience. And people may not realize it, but, you know, as you you've point out in the book, there's a reason why. American troops were sent to places like Korea. There's a reason why, you know, we had air bases in places like Thai, uh, Thailand in the Cold War and why there's still a very large special operations presence in Thailand to this day. So in a way, we were facilitating this even if we weren't the ones pulling the trigger. And it feels like that's an, that's an additional reckoning that needs to take place that hasn't really happened with regard to Vietnam, maybe to a large, to, you know, more so with Vietnam, but absolutely not with any of these other conflicts. And it feels to me like that's a similar kind of, how would you describe it? An act of deliberate erasure of memory of an unwillingness to confront it and also the desire to create a counter narrative, much like what you've described to a much larger degree in places like uh, Brazil and in Indonesia. Oh, there's, a, there's a lot of interesting stuff that I want to get to. What year were you in Honduras? I was there for the end of 2010 and the beginning of 2011. So I went there in... At the end of 2009 to 2010, just after the overthrow of President Zelaya, yeah. at the time Zelaya was he being held, uh, he, he had taken refuge in the Brazilian embassy because Lula was still the president here. And I, w I, I had to sneak into the country because they were, I was told that I would not be able to fly directly into Tegucigalpa. Uh, they would have asked me what I was doing. And if I was a journalist, they might not have let me in. So I, I went and talked to a lot of the people in the quote unquote resistance to the new post Zelaya government and uh, things did not turn out for a lot of those people. I'm, I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm like afraid to look up all the names of the people I've interviewed and see who might no, no longer be alive. But it's really interesting, like that you brought up Honduras because I mean, did you notice in the book, like where Honduras pops up a couple of times? Because like, it's interesting you said Thailand because essentially in Central America, Honduras was to the, the dirty wars as, Thailand was to Vietnam. So yeah. in, in 1954, when the CIA was organizing the coup of Hakob Arbenz, the, the troops that they assembled for this kind of a PSYOP fake invasion were assembled in Honduras. And then in the late 70s, after the fall of Allende to Pinochet, after the formation of Operation Condor, which was this international mass murder network in South America, Honduras was where... Operation Condor military um, uh, forces met with Central American right-wing forces to train them in terror, essentially. And then eventually the United States joined because there was a brief moment in the late 70s when Jimmy Carter made this kind of difficult for the yeah. US to do. But then, it, but, then it, but then it was like this was where Operation Condor plus US forces trained um, the, the people that would eventually carry out the mass murder of hundreds of thousands of people in, in places specifically uh, Guatemala, El Salvador, Nicaragua. <laughs> and like, absolutely, it's been an erasure. It's hard to say. I don't know if it's, I mean, I don't think they ever wanted us to know, right? I mean, but I also think that there's something about the way that we want to remember our own history, uh, especially being trained as like the kind of Americans that I, you know, that I was trained to be, that it's just easier to forget these kinds of horrible things. But it's, it's I think it's really important that we don't. And then, so for the book, I, um, I ended up going to Guatemala where some of these death squads carried out uh, the extermination of entire villages. And I, I met some people whose village was like half exterminated. They killed most of the men um, and committed horrible atrocities against all the women who were taken into sort of concentration camps slash slave, slave camps. And how are they doing now? Uh, well, as you might guess, their only source of income is to send their kids to be immigrants. In the United uh, States, in yeah. The, in, in the United States. 
And so again, like this is not just like, oh, we got to, we have to confront this, these horrible things we did. It's in order to understand what's happening in U.S. politics now, what's happening at the border, what it is, the ways that we continue to engage around the world. Uh, I think it's yeah, I think it's really important. But yeah, Honduras is is a perfect example. What did what was the what was the deployment like? Well, I don't know if you want to talk about what you personally did, but what, yeah, did, of course. what in general? What, what the what was the U.S. military doing at the time in general? So. After the coup took place, there was no direct military to military contact for a period of about a year. And then all of a sudden, uh, the focus became on surveillance of narcotics trafficking, but without any, there wasn't really very many instances of people doing any kind of direct action so much as supplying, at least what we were told, supplying intel to the Hondurans. But obviously the Honduran government, as you well know, is so incredibly corrupt that yeah. their, their focus isn't really on stopping drug trafficking. So a lot of times when they would conduct raids, those raids were staged, basically. They were, you know, you'd you'd roll up a plane, everybody would give, give I mean, I wasn't there personally, but you'd hear these, these you know, summaries and people gave themselves away. But then also in, in situations where the government didn't, we hadn't negotiated with the cartels, for example, uh, you know, they, they, they captured a drug plane and then somehow uh, militants showed up and broke into an airbase and stole the plane back and then flew, you know, left the country. I don't know. Okay. They flew to, so things like that. But what I did and what we were told our mission was, was basically that Soda Cano Air Base is a very large, has a very, very large airstrip. It's the, the, the place where the Honduran Air Force Academy is located. They train their forces there. It's a huge airstrip in the middle of the Comayagua Valley. And so you can land a C-5 Galaxy there. You can land basically any kind of military aviation there, aside from maybe that enormous Soviet plane that uh, there's like one of in the entire world. Well, that's and really so, interesting because I don't want to stop you, but that's really interesting because Tegucigalpa, I think, has the shortest runway on- The worst the airport in the world for landing <laughs> I think it's quite in. literally yeah, it's just, the shortest runway on planet Earth, or it was at the time. Like you had to come in between two mountains and they just like smash into the ground. So it's funny that the Honda, yeah. I was going to say, man, I have, I have landed at that airport probably seven or eight times and it's always terrifying. You're always convinced that the wing, I mean, you've, you probably, I imagine you've done this too, but I was always convinced that the, the, the wing tips were going to clip power lines because yeah. you do this weird spiral into the valley. Yeah, it's, it's just madness. But, but the, the, the point we would do basically they said okay well there's invariably there's natural disasters all over the region and so if the u.s embassy calls in, in those countries you know is requested to provide assistance to these countries we you know we're going to marshal forces in at, at soto cano air base because it's uh or it was formerly called palmarola air base and i think at one point they decided to rename it uh we're going to you know provide supply forces there and so in order to keep that skill set there we will do more or less once a month or once every two months medical assistance package missions you know with the coordination of the u.s embassies in different regions so as a captain i went there um they wanted somebody of my my rank and experience i guess which was not you know a a new staff officer basically and we planned and did these medical assistance missions but the, the, the level of medical assistance we provided uh, you, this would probably be no surprise, is that you would basically do triage and you would give people, you'd tell them what you think was wrong with them and you'd give them ibuprofen. But there was no follow-up care. There was no intensive care. They couldn't do x-rays. They couldn't do anything like that. Whereas by comparison, uh, the U.S. Embassy, if there were you know highly connected people uh, in countries like we did one in, um, I didn't go, but a friend of mine who was a Dutch speaker did, in Suriname, it was for extremely connected people within uh, the, you know, the Surami, Sur- Surinamese uh, sort of elite who were then receiving medical care from military surgeons, which is insane, but the US, the ambassador wanted it and so they did it. Uh, and so we went to, me personally, I, I was there to run, I mean, my, my, my background at the time, I was a, an officer in an airborne infantry unit and I had experience running a bunch of you know, airfield things. So we went to run these and just coordinate the air in, in certain extraction of, it would typically be American military personnel uh, who were primarily medical, some logistics and support, and then local national military. So Honduran military, Salvadorian military. Um, and then, uh, you know, depending on where things were, they might also have, and I discovered this later, American Special Operations Forces there. And invariably, those were because they were doing special reconnaissance to then conduct raids with the governments they were working with. So we'd go and we'd hand out medic- medicine 
you know, to a limited degree. And then three weeks later, they'd go do like a direct action raid on what they thought was a drug trafficking spot or something. And it was, uh, it, to me, I think it was, it was, it was deeply frustrating because, you know, not getting to my own story too much, but because what I discovered was basically like we weren't, there was this notional idea of aid, but we weren't actually able to provide aid because you're not sticking around and doing anything. You're telling people like, oh yeah, right. like your, bo- your, your, bone, your bone that was broken healed badly, but you need reconstructive surgery. Here's some fucking Motrin. You right. know what I mean? Like, it's not really, it, it wasn't really anything that they could help. And I mean, it was sold as like, hey, it's just a six month deployment to do humanitarian assistance. But for me, at least, it was kind of a, a, a radicalizing experience. And I think one of the reasons was, Paul, formerly Paul Marola, now Soto Cano Air Base, was, uh, as I understand it, there was at least some sort of auxiliary facility there uh, for the whole Contra operation in the 80s. And I was at the time uh, training to go to the Army Special Forces selection to become a Green Beret. Uh, and so I would do these long ruck marches around the perimeter of the base, which I think was about seven miles. And you could see the old base, the old old base with wash racks for trucks and old hard, hard stand buildings and some radio antennas. And people on the base called it the Ollie North compound. Right. And so you realize like, not only is this very real in the history of the place, but you were on the side that was doing the atrocities. Yeah. And that kind of led me to the thought process that eventually I, I was selected as a, to be a Green Beret. I went through the training program and was going to be assigned to 7th Special Forces Group, which, yes, you know, covers Central and South America. And so that's why I opted to quit the program. And that's wow. why I got out, got out of the military and, uh, and I am where I am today doing this. Uh, but, I, you know, that, that background is such because you realize just how much of that history is there. You know, going to El Salvador, I can't remember the name of the, air, the airport, but there is a, a military air base where the Salvadorian Air Force Academy is located in San Salvador, like legitimately in San Salvador. I can't remember its name. And I happened to Google its name at one point and just saw this article from Time Magazine in 1981 talking about, oh, well, yeah, US military forces are deployed here providing you know, humanitarian training on like teaching the Salvadorian military human rights. Right. Now, you and I know from reading that how much an absurd... Right. notion that is that in 1981 the u.s military was training the salvadoran military how to respect human rights given that right. they you know had murdered raped and murdered four american nuns the year prior right um in el salvador you'd see lots and lots and lots of old california national guard uh1 huey helicopters and ah1 cobra helicopters that were given to the salvadoran military but then we'd go and do these medical missions in villages outside, not in San Salvador, but you know, in the in the the provinces outside, where these villages had at times been strafed, probably by some of the, if not those same helicopters, then the same model of helicopters donated from the United States. Mm-hmm. And so you there was this realization like this is this is not uh, a thing that's done. The consequences are still here. And it's I don't know, like it's just different when you see it for yourself. And I feel like a lot of our listeners have probably had similar experiences elsewhere if they are military or were military. Um, so reading this book really kind of hammered that home that, you know, you, you get these little snapshots of it in El Salvador, in Honduras. Um, in my case, I, uh, I spent some time in Thailand, uh, in South Korea, and then as a civilian tourist visited Indonesia. Um, my dad, I realized I connected this from, from reading your book. My dad, his father was an army officer. And my, my dad was like, oh, yeah, I went to kindergarten and first grade in Brazil. I realize now why, because my dad would have been, you know, six or seven in the late 50s, early 60s. Yeah. And he was, his, his dad was helping train the Brazilian military that goes on to do all the things that you describe in this book. You realize how big of a picture it is. And so to me, I feel like that's the, the thing that make, made reading this so tremendous was just that reckoning of here's, here's a, a picture of what the entirety of it was, as opposed to, you know, the various dispatches about freedom fighters that we grew up with. Yeah, no, there's like, um, and I think that like, a lot of like as you said a lot of these things have been established over the years through declassified files and you know like hardworking academics or sort of heroic activists in the individual countries but the one thing that um i think that no one did before and perhaps we weren't really allowed to do is to really take step back and take a huge look at the global (laughs) the global picture and how one thing leads to another and how it's all how much of it is interconnected and um I think it, that that could be really jarring. I mean, it was really jarring for me. Um, I mean, when I went into researching this book, I didn't consider myself like a naive, uh, you know, U.S. citizen. I thought I had a pretty good idea of all, you know, you know, uh, the bad things we did in the Cold War or whatever. But it was much worse than I thought. And it was it was a really sort of a destabilizing experience psychologically um, that I'm still sort of like working through. But no, I I, I totally think you're right that it's. Like the the big the big picture of it is what really can be um, 
most jarring. I want to ask though, like, uh, there's so much interesting stuff you just said. The uh, when when you were in uh, uh, Honduras in in the in like 2010 2011 was the political situation. I mean, I'm sure you're, everyone knows, right? Like, the the government had lost legitimacy, and Hillary Clinton basically signed off on this on this coup, and, and things have been absolutely awful in Honduras since 2009. Was that were, was that like what stage of the political situation was it? Uh, were you there in? So. When I went there, I had only ever been to a Spanish-speaking country as an adult once. I'd gone to the Dominican Republic. I, didn't, I mean, I speak French, but I didn't speak Spanish at the time. I, uh, I landed, and I remember we got off the, the plane you know, at, at Tegucigalpa Airport and then got put on like a minibus, civilian minibus, and, and driven the you know, two-hour drive up and down the mountains to get to the Comayagua Valley. And in and around the city of Tegucigalpa, you saw graffiti everywhere that said stuff like Fuera Golpistas. Right. And I remember writing it down in my little, you know, law, army officers, you typically have your little green book, even if you're in civilian clothes, and writing down like Golpistas. I knew what Fuera meant, but I didn't know what Golpista meant. Right. And I, I, I didn't know there had been a coup. I looked it up and I was like, oh, there, was there a coup in this country? And you'd see every, every week they would have laborers come and paint over the cinder block walls at Soto Cano because of the graffiti being written. There were times, you know, when you could, you, you, if you wanted to, you could go on pass as long as you had somebody with you, you couldn't go alone. And you could go out in Comayagua, you could go to some of the vacation, like tourist spots, or you could go to Tucuzugalpa even. Most people would typically, you know, stay at the, the, the I think it's the Sheraton, the really nice hotel there. Yeah, there. There's like two nice hotels in the city. I stayed like across the street in the semi-nice. Yeah, 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 and 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 you'd go to the mall that has armed security everywhere. But in the city of Tegucigalpa, you know, you'd see these these snapshots. You'd see barricades. You'd see cars on fire. You'd see just scenes of things that you wouldn't, that if you're not prepared for, you know, like you've described, entire families living on the streets. You know, homeless children begging. Uh, I, at one point, I just saw a, a completely naked man just walking down the street. Things like that. That you're like, this is clearly a place that has been massively destabilized but there was not only was there no uh, attempt to prepare people for it i mean the security briefings that we would get as, as military members it'd be like okay here's your international security travel brief and it would all be about like al-qaeda yeah. and not about the place that you're going and one of the things that was shocking to me was you know they just did a monthly program there they're like okay we want to do cultural awareness classes and they asked me could i run a class on basically countries in the region. And so I got tapped because I was a captain to teach this class on the history of Nicaragua. Right. Now, I don't know the first thing about Nicaragua, but they had a bunch of books there like the CIA fact book and a bunch of other things that I could use. So I started reading. And the more I read about Nicaragua, the more I thought like, this is completely insane. Like I had, I remember the story of like, oh yeah, the communists took over. And I'm a fan, hilarious side note that you, you, you cited the exact lyric that was in my mind from the Clash song, Washington Bullets. Right, right, right. This bizarre, this very tragically hopeful picture that they painted when they wrote that song, you know, in 1979, 1980, about the Sandinista revolution versus what happened. And starting to read it, reading about the, the, the various US occupations, the fact that the Marines were there like five or six times, the whole story of William Walker, and uh, the filibusters, all these things. I was like, this is, it's weird to me that the military has asked me to teach this class and has provided me all these materials that any sane person would read and be like, this is, this paints such a deeply uncomfortable picture of the United States. Yeah. And so having experienced that there and having seen it, and I think, you know, to the point of what you mentioned about the people you met in Guatemala, the sheer abject poverty and the fact that if you, if you were a young person in that country and your family isn't already wealthy, there is no hope of you ever achieving social mobility unless you leave and go to the United States. And seeing that and realizing that if I, you know, I was born in 1984, if I was born in Honduras in 1984, I absolutely would have emigrated because what, what else could you do? Uh, and seeing that, it just painted such a different picture for me of A, the United States' relationship to its, to its neighbors and B, you know, the, the legacy of what we did in the Cold War versus, you know, I grew up, my dad was an army officer reading, uh, Reader's Digest, you know, talking about like the heroic crusades against anti-communism and, and speaking in very, you know, storied and legendary tones about people like Jonas Savimbi or, uh, you know, the, right, the, right, the, right. The, con the Contras or, you know, people abroad anywhere, you know, anywhere that the U.S. was involved. And so I think to me reading this book, one of the things that really it kind of crystallized to me was there's a line specifically talking about, you know, why, why the PKI, the, the Party Communist Indi Indonesia, 
why target the you know Indonesian Communist Party so much? What was what given it wasn't as militant as you know, the propaganda painted. Given it wasn't an armed party, it wasn't an extra parliamentary party. It it was it was involved. From what I can understand, it was involved in politics. And there's a line that I thought was pretty telling that I you know highlighted and starred that basically says U.S. strategy since the 1950s had been to find to try to find a way to destroy the Indonesian Communist Party, not because it was seizing power undemocratically, but because it was popular. No, that's that's precise. That's precisely right. And uh, these are the kind of things that you can't like people don't believe you unless you show them the the receipts. And like we have Decl- Nixon says this. He says, you know, demo- so the PKI was not only part of the system, they were doing the best within it. So when ev- elections eventually stopped, in 1959 in Indonesia, they were the, the, the group within Indonesia that was pressed hardest for the continuation of elections. And the group, unsurprisingly, that pushed hardest for the cancellation election of elections was the U.S.-backed military. And, yeah, um, yeah. and, they, and we have now Nixon saying, um, he said, while well, vice president under Eisenhower, democracy is probably not the right so, uh, uh, form of government for Indonesia because the communists can't be beat. And they would have won. So they, they, they were, I mean, you could imagine the PKI in a different world, in a world without U.S. aggression, becoming kind of like the social, the SPD, the Social Democrats in Germany, where they just stay in parliament forever and push for like higher wages. You could imagine them being like the Italian Communist Party, um, just staying as a minority party in a parliamentary, parliamentary system forever. But that was precisely the problem. And... In the case of, for example, Chile, uh, in before IND even takes power, the United States U.S. officials are saying not that they're afraid that he's going to be dem- uh, authoritarian, authoritarian. They say two things. One, they're afraid that he's going to be a democratic socialist and it's going to work and inspire other people. And two, they come up with strategies to try to make him become authoritarian so that they can justify crushing him. So a lot of the narrative we get about the Cold War is like, well, well, you know, there were bad communists out there and they needed to be stopped. There were bad communists out there, but it was precisely when they were popular that we needed to bring in the big guns because when we couldn't, our side couldn't win elections, that's when our advantage is military, right? And this is, I mean, that's basically the case in Vietnam too, right? I mean, as you mentioned, Vietnam wasn't important as Indonesia because Indonesia was the biggest domino. And yeah, McNamara in his memoir says that once, once Indonesia had fallen to the Western camp in 65, they knew that they didn't really need to win in, in, in Vietnam, but they still didn't want to give a victory to the communists. The whole reason there was a war is because the 1956 referendum, which was supposed to reunite the, the country, was canceled because the United States and uh, the South Vietnamese government knew that Ho Chi Minh would win, right? The whole reason that the United States military had to get involved in Vietnam was that we had more guns than them, but they had more votes. So we had to shift the, the, the field of battle to, to the military. Um, and the... The connect the deep deep connections you talk about in Brazil and Indonesia are really important for like for how these the two co- two coups go down because they try other mechanisms me- me- mechanisms right like it was not the first it was not their first uh, first choice but after trying to bribe politicians didn't work and then after trying to support regional rebellions didn't work in 1958 in, in Indonesia. They switch shift to a new tactic, which is establishing ideological hegemony within the Indonesian military. And, um, as you saw in the book, they bring loads of Indonesians to Kansas to train them um, in counterinsurgency, basically in anti-communism in general. They try to get them to like America, which kind of works, but they also pay them a lot of money. And they do this because the other fields of quote unquote battle, the political or the ideological, the, their side is losing. Everybody in, you know, people in Indonesia before the eruption of violence in 1965 do not have a problem with the Indonesian Communist Party. They're seen as very much a part of the fabric of this new nation led by President Sukarno. And in, in Guatemala in 54, we have declassified files that say the same thing. Even though the rhetoric was that, oh, Arbenz is going to be a... Uh, a, a, a front for Soviet interests in Central America. Behind the scenes, we knew that they knew that that was nonsense. But what they said that they were afraid of was that 
if Guatemala succeeded in sort of standing up to U.S. interests and U.S. corporations, everyone else would want to do it too. That was the real problem. There's a line in here that really struck me also. It was just a, an excerpt from a meeting basically with Richard Nixon uh, where he, you, I'm just going to read the full quote. And this is, so this is Richard Nixon speaking, talking about Salvador Allende. Our main concern in Chile is that Allende can consolidate himself and the picture projected to the world will be his success. If we let the potential leaders in South America think they can move like Chile and have it both ways, we'll be in trouble. I want to work on this and on military relations, put in more money. On the economic side, we want to give him cold turkey. We'll be very cool and very correct, but doing these other things, which will be a real message to Allende and others, no impression should be permitted in Latin America that they can get away with this. Yeah, and this being this being what democratic socialism. It's like the world, the most powerful nation that has ever existed, will do everything to destroy you. We will that we will organize an international capital strike, and and of course, you know, this, as anybody that studies sort of developing developing country economics or politics, you can't you can't exist if the if if there's no more capital for your country. The the, the countries of the third world exist in, in, in such a state of underdevelopment that you need financing from the first world. And we're going to organize right-wing terrorists before you even take over. And so a lot of people, again, like the liberal, not even on the right, but the liberal narr- narrative about Allende is often, oh, well, yeah, he had, you know, there was a coup, but it came after he kind of screwed up the economy. So the right wing of the country didn't like him anymore and they overthrew him. Right-wing terrorism murdered the leader of the, the Chilean armed forces for being a supporter of the constitution before Allende even took over. So right-wing terrorists b- backed by the United States had a plan, which is by the way, eerily familiar. If you know what happened in 1965, I think there's a really good chance that they were just copying the success of Indonesia. Although I, I don't make that claim because I don't have any evidence for it, but I think I hope somebody else looks into it. They have the strategy of kidnapping Rene Schneider, the head of the Chilean military because he's a, a, so, a so-called constitutionalist, which means that he doesn't believe that there should be military coups in Chile. He thinks that Chile is different. Chile is a more democratic country, and Chile doesn't do military coups. This is, by the way, what Allende thinks, and which is why he thinks that he can try his peaceful road to socialism. He is kidnapped by right-wing terrorists who have a plan to blame it on the left and use it to justify a coup. They murder him, and this is before Allende even takes office. Right, The, the country is rocked by capital strike, and literal terrorism just for electing the guy. He's never even given a chance to screw up. One of the things that really blew my mind reading this was I've read a lot about Chile because, you know, in the aftermath of Trump winning, I saw a lot of people that I knew were military vet- American military veterans or people that I knew online, uh, you know, via just interacting with, with what we might describe as military Twitter or veteran Twitter, and then people that I knew in real life who had friended me on Facebook. And obviously, this narrative took shape of, you know, the sort of the left interlopers, the, the cultural Marxists, the Marxist, you know, terrorists, Antifa, whatever you want to call all these, these boogeymen that have been crafted. And I read about, you know, you constantly see, you know, guys who are in the military now or ex-military basically talking about, you know, helicopters and executing leftists, basically, you know, using helicopters to disappear bodies. And I was so, I was just, you know, frustrated by this. I, I was like, what, you know, what the fuck is happening? And I knew this, basically, I'd read, um, you know, Operation Condor. Though there's a book about Operation Condor. I can't remember the exact title, but uh, I, you, you may be familiar with it. Probably d- it d- the Condor. The con- d- dangerous, the Condor years, right? The Condor years, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that was it. And then I read, uh, you know, uh, The Shock Doctrine, as right. well, Naomi Klein's The Shock Doctrine. So I was loosely familiar with it. But, you know, I, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm sick of this. It's making me unwell. I'm going to log off for like a month. And I just got as many books as I could about Chile and read them. And one of the things that I thought was even with people that were sympathetic to Allende uh, was that you know, there was this idea, there was this no- notion that the, the, the MIR, the International Revolutionary Movement, was these sort of, they, they, they were almost equivalent ideologically to the Shining Path. They were so hardline militant. But right. then you read this and it's sort of like the writing was on the wall that they wanted to kill you. And yeah. the thing that struck me the most was them basically being terrorized or being sort of provoked by people riding around, riding, you know, going around Santiago writing, you know, Jakarta is coming or, you know, you, you know, I, I don't know the exact translation of uh, Asar Karse, but you know what I mean? Like yeah, getting closer. Yeah, and, it's getting closer. Yeah. Yeah, Jakarta is coming in. Yeah. 
And it's like, basically, Jakarta was to that kind of right-wing authoritarian anti-communist fanatic what the the image of Condor and Dina throwing people out of helicopters into the ocean is to these modern day fascists. Yep. And once again, it's just one of these things where you realize that these, are, these aren't outliers. And you also realize that the entirety of how this has been portrayed in history is one of basically, it's not too many steps removed. It's sort of like a, a more dinner party acceptable version of that same kind of fanatic imagery of you know demons and people you know witches emasculating men and stuff that the communists are these you know horrible evil driven monsters who want to practice you know just the absolute worst forms of deviancy when it sounds like i mean and like i said maybe going out on a limb here that the reason why we only hear the stories of the most repressive and violent and authoritarian communists is because the ones who were willing to work in the democratic system were all murdered Yep, I think that's a, I think that's a that is not something I was trying to so like like a lot uh, I, know, I, know, I know you weren't trying to be like this is what happened but when you read this I'm like yeah no exactly like that is something I think that emerges from the story and it was not like I wasn't trying to get there so like you know so I've there have been like a couple of reviews have come out of the book and there's been you know it's gotten like passed around on social media a bit and and some people, you know, uh, understandably think that it's the kind of book that a lot of people write, like kind of this pundit book where you like assemble stuff in the service of a point you want to make. Uh, like, but it absolutely is not that. Like, I went through and I wanted to find out what happened and tell the story without sort of, I, without you know, allowing the reader to to go wherever they wanted with whatever it quote unquote means. I still don't know personally what it quote unquote means, but I definitely did not. I wasn't trying to come to the conclusion that you have to be authoritarian socialist or else you'll be murdered, but it kind of emerges. Like if you, it, it's it, and I didn't, I was very uncomfortable with the fact that it did, but it, it, if you, if you look at the 20th century, the very few left-wing movements that survived are the ones that at some point in their history realized they had to get hardcore and then got hardcore. So the, the example of Che Guevara in Guatemala, I think, is really instructive because uh, che, Guevara, che Guevara was in Guatemala in, in 1954 when Arbenz was overthrown by the CIA. And there, was, there were debates as the coup was happening. Um, well, do we just kind of let them do it because it's America? You know, they're gonna get, it's going to work anyways. Or do we fight? And Che was saying, no, we got to fight. And the people that said, oh, well, it'll be fine, a lot of them ended up dead. And so Che came to the conclusion, like, no, 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 you can't do democratic socialism. You have to have sort of a tightly organized defensive state, which is capable of, of repelling imperialism. And like, if you were a democratic socialist in 1960 in Cuba, that was a rational, that was a very understandable position to take. And he ended up, I think, through a combination of luck and that defense surviving. Then you have uh, China who, you know, Mao's, Mao's movement found out uh, in 1927 that the nationalists would, would be willing to massacre them if they got the chance. And they, the, 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 the nationalists killed approximately one million people uh, in 1927. And afterwards, Mao became like, nope, nope, nope. You never allow for the possibility of infiltration. You never allow for the possibility of destabilization from outside. And in this book, I mean, this comes up again in 1965 because the Chinese Communist Party is in constant contact with the Indonesian Communist Party. And the Indonesian Communist Party resists Mao's direction. Mao and Zhou Enlai are trying to get the Indonesian Communists to arm. And the Indonesian Communists are like, no, 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 no. We're, we're part of a pluralist revolution here. We're, you know, we don't want to upset the army. It's fine. And they all end up dead. And in Chile, uh, you just you just referred quickly to the MIR. I'll just explain what that is. So, in in uh, on the left at the time uh, during the government of Salvador Allende, you had the Socialist Party, which was Allende's actual party. You had the Chilean Communist Party, which in many ways was more moderate than the Socialist, because everyone always forgets this. But the line coming from Moscow in South America for most of the Cold War was, "Hey, chill out." Uh, just like participate in bourgeois democracy because you'll you'll get there eventually. But the real reason they were saying this is because they didn't want to provoke the United States unnecessarily. They considered it U.S. territory and they didn't want to rock the boat. And then you had the MIR who technically 
uh, did not believe in elections. They took some inspiration from the, the Che Guevara line or the post Che Guevara armed struggle line. And they, even though they said they didn't participate in the 1970 election, a lot of them voted anyways, they were excited. But technically their line was, no, you can't get to socialism without guns because reaction will kill you. And they, you know, as I put out in the book, there was these, there were conversations about Indonesia in deciding these ideological lines and the Communist Party said, no, 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 no. We're going to stick with the Moscow line. We're going to be more moderate. We're going to sort of participate in bourgeois democracy. The socialists, of course, um, believed in using the democratic system. They were a little bit more radical. They wanted to push a little bit faster. And a lot of the people I met whose like friends or family members were killed said, I never wanted to believe that MIR was right. I will always wanted to believe that there was a democratic path. But unfortunately, they were right. They weren't going to let us do it. And I don't know what the lesson is for, for that, that, arrives, that arises from that. But in, those, in all three cases, the people who believed most sincerely in the existence of, of the rules, the people that believed that the U.S. stood for what it said it stood for and, and then believed that if you did everything right, that you would get away with it. All of them were, were proved wrong. One of the things that has struck me in this moment is, you know, you talk about this in the book that this fanatical anti-communist line basically allows for the wholesale, you might call uh, excommunication of any kind of politics that reaction opposes, whether it's actual communism, whether it's social democracy, whether it's even, you know, social justice things that are not necessarily related to economic struggles. They can just be painted as communist and they can be dismissed. They can be outlawed and, and repressed. And I'm struck by, you know, the two big sort of moments I, I feel like in our lifetimes where I think we're close in age is the fall of the Berlin Wall and then and 9-11. And you basically have this world that we live in now where it feels as though it's pretty easy to call things terrorism to get them dismissed. And there's obviously this notion that there is no alternative. I mean, uh, that, that, you know, the, to, to, to quote Mark Fisher, who's probably more you know, better known among British listeners than American listeners, that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. And I feel like there's this, I'm not going to say that it's, it's, it's a tendency, but it feels like there is a notion that a lot of this stuff is just kind of exists in nature, that it's not forced upon people. But when I think about the, I mean, maybe you, I think you were in Brazil, but you might've been in the US when it looks as though Bernie Sanders was going to do, was going to take the primary or during the, the reactions to the 20, 2017 G general election in the UK and then the, the lead up to the actual vote in 2019. Basically, you saw reality invert itself because the, this mass, I don't know, media freak out, which is, I mean, I want to make it very clear, obviously not the same thing as a, you know, state brutality and terror, but this idea that things that you take for norms and take, take as givens can change whenever people, whenever it seems as though the system you exist in is being threatened. And in a way, you know, that can start to sound like really out there conspiracy theories. That can start right. to sound really deranged. But then when you think about what that looks like and feels like having experienced it, and then you go back and you read a book like yours, you realize that, I mean, in a way, it's horrendous and sad and deflating, but it, they're giving us the light treatment by comparison. Yeah. Because it can absolutely get worse. And here is this very documented history of not only mass murder and mass political repression, but also the sort of mass extermination of memory. Yeah. And that to me, I think is the craziest part is that think about, you know, how much we learn growing up, even, you know, about things like the Khmer Rouge. We don't get a lot of education about it, but I feel like it's out there. You hear about Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge. Right. Absolutely. You hear about th the crimes of communism. And yet here is a story of a million people being, a million unarmed people being murdered by the state. And there's almost no mention of it. And honestly, the only mentions of it that I, at least that I, can think of have been relatively recent in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, and uh, just again, 
Khmer Rouge is always touted as a is like something to throw on the scoreboard for the victims of communism. But number one, the United States supported the Khmer Rouge from throughout the late seventies to the end of the Cold War because of anti-Vietnam sentiment. Jimmy Carter told uh, China that they could and should invade Vietnam in order to punish them for the liberation of Cambodia from the of the Khmer from the Khmer Rouge. And um, Suharto in in East Timor killed a larger percentage of the population than than even took place under the horrors of Pol Pot. So it's like even like the even the th- thing that is held up. If you just look to, you know, look look just just zoom in two clicks, it doesn't tell the story that it it's supposed to. But you don't you don't zoom in two clicks, do you? Um, but uh, yeah, and like speed. So Bernie Sanders thing. I was very quiet about this. Um, I was relatively quiet about this. I think we talked about this actually on uh, Trash Future. But like, when a lot of people in the United States were very excited about the possibility of Bernie Sanders presidency, I didn't say this out loud once, but I did. I think say it on on Trash Future. I said, um, "Look, maybe this is just me being." with my head too deep in the wrong history, but I don't think they're going to let Bernie Sanders be the, you know, be the president of the United States. And like, I think that, I think that you pointed to, I think you put it really well that like the rules all are the rules until like the really powerful people see their interests threatened. And then they, they may not be the rules anymore. So I always thought that although Bernie Sanders totally transformed American politics, I thought there was some kind of a ceiling, right? I thought whether, you know, maybe they would let him get this far or that far, or maybe even become president, but they would never let him implement a social democratic platform, and I, but I hope that um, I hope that in a way like f- seeing this these patterns emerge like in in the long term is somehow more empowering than discouraging because like the initial process that I went through uh, reporting the book was like oh my god fuck 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 and it you know shook my idea of, you know what my country was and what 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 globalization is or whatever but I as I like sat with it longer I hopefully come out on the other side with like a clear understanding of how political change can actually happen and and how how um, how how smart and informed you need to be to really to carry out any kind of a transformative political project. One of the things that I feel like this book I hope makes people realize is that a lot of well let's just put it this way I'll, I'll cite the line where one of you, you, your sources, Francisco, one of the, the in, I believe she's Indonesian that you spoke to, um, talks about why it is that you have, you know, because she, if I remember correctly from the story, she had studied in the Netherlands and right. then returned to Indonesia after the basically in, Indonesian independence. Right. And she returned to the Netherlands much later and reflecting on the fact that if you look at how different the Netherlands was after World War II versus, you know, immediate aftermath of World War II versus in, you know, the, the present day, that it's, it's, it's night and day and that, you know, you have social democracy, you have a welfare state, you have all of these uh, things that exist that, you know, are get taken as givens. I mean, obviously the welfare state is being eroded across pretty much everywhere in Europe, but what the standard of living changes between, you know, let's say from 1945 until the present are so astronomical. Right. And she says, I'm going to cite the book. It says, it was very clear to Francisco why Europeans were allowed to experiment with social democracy and even communist politics while her country had been taken away from her forever. Quote, racism, very simply, white Europeans are offered tolerance and sympathetic treatment while we are not, unquote. And that to me, I mean, kind of, kind of summarizes it. I mean, you, you cite the line talking about, I believe it was a, I can't remember the name of the person who said it, but it's a thing that we've heard so much about, you know, explaining away the massacres in Indonesia because life in Asia is cheap. Yeah. There is this notion of who's allowed to do what, and it's very racialized. And I feel like we're seeing a strange moment in America, you know, and I'm I'm saying this from far away, you're also not in America, but it feels like there's a reckoning that has to happen. And, and at times you get this notion that maybe there's going to be some kind of bigger realization in the same way that, you know, you talk about this in the book that not all the countries have, you know, not all countries have been as completely denialist about what happened as Indonesia. You know, you look at a country like Chile, which has had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which has, you know, attended to the crimes of the, of the state to some extent. You know, um, Pinochet was arrested and put on trial and convicted, but then if I remember correctly, he died. I can't remember if he died after he was convicted or before, but um, you have this, 
this reckoning that's taking place in some countries, but in other places, you know, I'm, I'm struck by, I remember, you know, not citing the book, but rather my, my memory of, of uh, Joshua Oppenheimer's The Act of Killing. There was, remember correctly, a radio interview and a person or TV interview, and they were talking about the subject of this and some of the work he was doing. And one of the, the radio hosts was just, or the TV host was just like, yes, but those are all communists they killed. Why should we feel bad about that? Right. And it's just, it, it, it's such a night and day thing to look at it and say, you know, here's one country that killed, you know, t- thousands of people in, you know, brutality and mass suppression has come up with something of a means of addressing it. And here's another country that has said, no, yeah, we killed a million people, but they were all bad. And you know, as you describe in the book, even the people to this day who are now quite, quite old are living in total social isolation because of the stain of having been in any way associated with the Indonesian Communist Party. And I just wonder, is that reckoning... Is that reckoning going to come? I mean, is that reckoning going to come in America for our own similar crimes? Like, I don't know. And I, I'm, I'm kind of spitballing the question, but I just wonder what your thoughts are on the general topic. Yeah, I think, well, my experience is meeting those Indonesians um, and other people around the world, too, that were active in, in politics in the 50s and 60s, not only on the left, but I mean, all politics by all of their politics by, uh, by contemporary standards would be considered left wing. Um, really illuminated two things that you touched upon recently. And one is the idea of that this, that our system is natural. Because one of the most sort of inspiring and moving, but also tragic things about doing these long interviews with these survivors is that when they spoke about their idea of what the future was going to be in the past, when they put, when they transported themselves back to 1959 or 1963 and told told me what they thought the future was going to bring. I could just see like a world open up behind their eyes uh, uh, of what they thought would be the rightful place of the third world on the world stage, the way that they would trans, trans, um, move towards a most, more socialistic socialist, so, uh, social system, a more egalitarian world, a more just and less racist world. And obviously all of that was taken away. But I don't think it was inevitable that it, that it would be taken away. And a lot of people in the 50s and 60s thought that this was coming. They thought, oh, well, you know, the racist white countries of Europe no longer control us. So obviously we should be able to stand up and take our place alongside the rest of the countries of the world as equals. Right. Um, and I don't think anybody in any uh, academic discipline can really has really offered an explanatory or a satisfactory explanation as to why this didn't happen. And um, the second uh, is the question of race in the United States. And I think that talking to these people, it was really like illuminating the way that they understood the United States in 1950, 55, 60. If you looked out at the world from Indonesia in, in, in the years just following colonialism, you thought, okay, over there is the Soviet Union. That is a country that has this new uh, attempt to modernize quickly. Uh, I don't know, I heard some good things, I heard some bad things, but they've never done anything to us. You know, they're, they at least claim that they're anti-colonialist, they claim they're anti-racist. I don't know if that's true, but they, as far as I know, they didn't do anything to me or my family. Then up there you have the, the white countries of Western Europe that enslaved Africa and Asia for hundreds of years. And they very, under, they very much understood that this was, these were countries that did not treat them as equal human beings and that they needed to, they could not trust. And then there was this new hegemon arising in North America, the United States of America. And they weren't quite sure how this country was going to treat them, but they absolutely understood that it was a racist country. I mean, they weren't stupid. They, they saw cowboy movies. They understood that the celebration of the genocide of the, of the indigenous peoples of the United States was like the dominant theme in American politics. They understood Jim Crow. They knew that the United States was a racist country. And if you look at the other side of the coin, the way that U.S. officials talked about Africa and Asia in the 50s and 60s, it, it was. The, the, way that they, the way that they chose their policies um, in regards to Sukarno or Patrice Lumumba in the Congo that the CIA tried to kill and eventually killed in, indirectly, it was clearly race um, Race motivated, right? This is these were racist policies carried out by an inherently racist country, and, and if you were in Indonesia, you had to be very stupid not to see that. And so, I think what I try to do in the book, and I think you have to do, is to, to situate the Cold War in the long history of European colonialism of the rest of the world, 
and the settler colonialism of the United States, which is a group, uh, which is a Western European, spe- I mean, you and I are both speaking English right now. Like, that's normal to us, but to someone in Indonesia, that's not normal. It's weird. Like, oh, you're from America, but you speak a country, a, a language from Europe. Like, why is that? Oh, because you killed all the people that are from America. Okay. And there's a, there's a, there's a passage, like, I, a lot of Indonesians came to Sao Paulo as a result of um, U.S.-backed military pogroms carried out in the early 60s. And, and this was their way that they, they explained Brazil, too. They're like, oh, okay, in Brazil, uh, the white people are in charge because they killed all the natives. They don't speak an, a Brazilian language. They speak a European language. Um, blacks are below the whites, and the indigenous are way below that. Okay, so how do I exist in this, in this racial hierarchy? The, and the state of things where a Western European settler colony is by far the predominant military and ideological force, as the United States has been for the last 70 years, is probably not going to last forever, and it's not a quote-unquote natural state of affairs at all. And perhaps the very fact that I was even allowed to write this book is proof that this is we're at a sort of moment of, of tension, that this system is, is, is wobbling. I'm not sure that I would be... I'm not sure that a big press in New York would have bought this book proposal if Barack Obama was still president. If there wasn't some sort of deep reckoning amongst English-speaking liberals as to what it really is that the United States is, and if there wasn't some sort of global re-examination as to whether or not a Western European settler colony running the whole world is the only state of affairs. Um, I I, I say this very um, cognizant of the fact that a worse state of affairs could be coming. You know, the fact that the global order is is in flux and 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 is not at, is not appear as stable as it did 15 years ago does not mean necessarily that things always get better. I think things sometimes get worse, but I think they can also get better. And um, I think for the for the moment, the really unipolar moment from maybe 1990 to 2015, it was so hard to imagine something other than a U.S. Unipol- U.S. led unipolar world that it wasn't like it wasn't worth thinking about. And I think that the fact that it's worth thinking about now may be evidence that there is some kind of a shift uh, underfoot. I wonder, um, given you know the, the, the fact that this show is a leftist take on military and veteran things effectively, uh, if in your readings, in your, your travels, your experiences, you've encountered anything that, like a book, a story, something along those lines that for people who are perhaps interested in re-examining the world and the U.S. military's role in the world, given, you know, what this book reveals and, you know, a lot of the stories involved. Is there something that you think you would recommend besides reading the book? Because I'm going to tell everybody who listens to the show, buy this fucking book. This is the, the, the best book about this topic that I've read in as long as I can remember. However, Vincent, you wrote the book. I'm wondering, is there anything else also, stories, et cetera, that you feel like would be illuminating? Yeah, um... I don't have the. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna fail to come up with a quick answer on the military angle because I'm drawing a blank. But there's a couple. Um, this this book, the book that, like the stories that are told in this book, happen against the backdrop, against a larger view of the Cold War. That's kind of put out by a Harvard historian called Odd Arn Westad, W E S T A D. And he has a book called The Global Cold War, which is just like a really even an even larger. If you if, if you want an even larger overview of the Cold War and, and the way that U.S. activity in the world ve- really mu- really fits into our... Uh, well, the way he put it... Um, let me see if I even... The way he puts it is he, he looks at um, the, the way the United States acts from 1945 to 1990 and he says, well, is this, really a, is this really an exception? Actually, if you go back all the way to the beginning of the foundation of the United States, the United States has always been an expansionist and militaristic power. And this is just how the United States acts. Um, and another, in a much shorter and very different book, is one by Richard Wright called The Colored Curtain. And Richard Wright was a black American, former communist, but still uh, uh, very politically active. And he, he goes to the, the 1955 Bandung Conference of Afro-Asian countries, the, this, this attempt at, that Sukarno was overseeing to bring together the countries of the third world. And he reports from the post-colonial world. And he, even as, even as someone who's experienced a lot of racism in the United States, he's skeptical of this attempt. 
but he becomes very convinced very quickly that, oh, the rest of the world lives in a condition of unacceptable, un- unacceptable exploitation. And this needs to be fixed and this should be fixed. And he believes that it will happen. And, and I think like there's some really like, there's some really illuminating ways that he talks about race and the, the blindness of the U.S. foreign policy est- establishment in 1955 that I think are really resonant with, uh, with 2020. He wrote Native Son. Uh, he's, he's a good writer too. So it's a lot, it's a short and quick uh, sort of snapshot of what, what the interaction between the first and the third world was in the middle of the 20th century. Well, uh, for Vincent Bevins, thank you so much for coming on What a Hell of a Way to Die. Uh, the Jakarta Method is from Hachette Book Group. It's available anywhere you buy books. I strongly, strongly recommend anyone listening, go out, get this book, read it. And thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you.